Heavenly Father, we thank you again that you are a speaking God, that your word is as relevant today as when it was first written. And Lord, would you speak to us through it? Would we hear your voice? And would your spirit shape and mould us? Amen. 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 For better or for worse, there's a lot of our parents in us, isn't there? Justin has inherited my poor eyesight. Chase has my bad knee. And Tyron, unfortunately, is cursed with my sense of humor. Maybe we wish we weren't so much like our parents. They have a similar nose. Maybe we wish we had a better temper. Maybe we wish we were a little bit taller or, or, or a bit more patient. But actually, we can't avoid being like them. Our likeness to them is proof of, of our relationship. We were cast from, from similar moulds. We know this is true, and now John applies this to our spiritual relationship with our Heavenly Father. Our likeness to God is the proof of our relationship with Him. If we say that we are God's children, then we must prove it by our godliness. Godliness just simply means God-likeness. We have three headings this morning as John helps us see how we share God's likeness. And we'll spend most of our time on the first heading and then deal with the last two uh, a bit more briefly. Here's the first, and it's a great truth for us to hold on to. Here it is. We are lavished with great love. We are lavished with great love. Take a look at verse 1 and 2. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Notice that in verse 2, John again addresses his readers as dear friends or beloved ones. And he loves them with the same quality of love as God's love for him. John wants us to grasp how radically different from all other sorts of love, God's love, God's agape love, really is. The force of, of what John is saying is that we need to take time to contemplate God's love and allow it to sink in deep into our hearts. It's really meant to take our breath away. What love God has lavished on us. Lavish is not a, an eyedropper dropping one drop of love at a time. It's a dump truck just... <laughs> God has lavished us with his love. It's meant to startle us, to take our breath away, to amaze us, so that we are left gasping in wonder, what sort of love is this? It's a surprising love. It, it, it might seem foreign, something we're not expecting, something, something we're not used to. The disciples used this kind of language in Matthew chapter 8, verse 27, when they were amazed by Jesus' power when he calms the storm. And they explain, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. And we're meant to say, what kind of love is this? Jesus is in a different category from anything we've ever come across before. And so is the Father's love for us. It's a love where the Father takes all the initiative to, to make us his children. A love that gives lavishly and freely to those who are totally undeserving. When we remember our sin and our rebellion, and then we think of God's unapproachable light that John describes in his letter. God's total holiness. We, we begin to sense something of, of John's wonder that God should ever bother 
with people like us. God's love delights to change rebels into children who belong to the family. Not only does God give us his name in verse 1, we are called children of God, but God gives us his status. In verse 2 it says, now we are children of God. This isn't wishful thinking. It's not fiction. It's eternal truth. It's eternal reality. We are children of God because of the love he has lavished on us. As we think about adoption, God adopting us as his children, we remember that the choice lay entirely, totally with the Father and was motivated only by his nature of love. It had nothing to do with us. Adoption is a legal action where a person takes into their family a child who isn't their own, who has no rights within that family. And he does that, he adopts them in order to give that child all the privileges of his own children. In Roman law and ours, an adopted child was entitled to all the rights, all the privileges of a natural born child. So what motivates someone to do that? Sometimes at at a huge cost. Maybe there's something attractive uh, about the child. And you go and look for a child to adopt and you interview children and you go and go and visit a bunch of children and you and you look at the children. Maybe there's something attractive about their personality or their or their looks. Or maybe there's an old a uh, friendship with, with, with their parents. But probably the most basic motivation would be pity, compassion, and love. And love gives. And, and that's exactly what God did when, according to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. But with us, there's, there's nothing attractive. There's nothing deserving in us to deserve that love. But God chose to love us because he is love. And that's the way God has always operated. Right from the beginning, way back in the Old Testament, God reminded Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7 and 8, he said, The Lord did not set his affection on you, And choose you because you were more numerous than other people. But it was because the Lord loved you. As Christians, we know that it is this love that has reached out towards us through Jesus Christ. It has lifted us out of sin and brought us into the family of God. Samuel Crosman describes our amazement and gratitude really well in his hymn. He wrote this. My song is love unknown. My Saviour's love to me, love to the loveless shown, that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? Because God's love is unconditional and limitless, I think sometimes we find that hard to accept. Many of the Christians uh, I meet have have never known a love like that in any other relationship. In childhood, they learned that their parents' approval and love had to be earned. By conforming to their parents' rules and living up to their expectations. And because they could never be good enough or achieve enough, they were never quite sure of genuine love. I heard of a student who rang up his dad to tell him the good news that he'd done really well in his final exams. Only to be told by his dad, his dad said this, good, that means we can still be friends. It's this kind of attitude that really hurts as we're growing up. And it's easy for us to then transfer those kinds of feelings to our relationship with God. 
There are so many Christians, this is really sad, who don't really accept God's lavish love for them. They're always trying to be good enough, trying to persuade God to love them, rather than accepting the fact that God already does. God loves you. If you are his child, he loves you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. God already loves us. So we don't get it. And what do we do? We try and prove ourselves to others. That our grades are good enough to pass with God. We think that if we, if we put in enough effort, surely God will bless us. But what we actually do, if we're doing that, what we're actually doing is we're perverting God's grace into a religion of works. We're mocking God's love for us. And what should be a delight? I am His I am loved by him. It becomes a duty and then it becomes a chore. God's grace is not determined by whether or not we have scored B plus, A plus, A star for our Christian lives this week. He lavishes love on all his children. And here's the thing. If God has chosen to make us his children, then he is going to bring us home to heaven. Verse 2. And what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. God is making us more like Christ. And we mustn't take things into our own hands as though we can earn that love. It is given. It is pure grace. He establishes the relationship. And to live in this relationship is to grow In the family likeness. How much of what we do is an expression of our love for the Lord who loves us? And how much comes from being driven by a desire to impress God? I think we know when we're trying to impress God, when we kind of make these little bargains with God. If I do this, then you do that. I'll give a little bit more money, but then you've got to help me with my debt or whatever. We need to remind ourselves all the time that our love relationship with the Father matters more than anything. What we are is far more important than what we do. We are loved children of God. We need to be what we are. Our confidence comes when we realize that our identity is God's dearly loved children. It doesn't depend on us. It depends on grace. It's not something we strive towards. It is something that is given to us. And when we have that confidence, when we depend on His grace, it helps us. It helps us because it will fill us with help, it will help us to cope with the details of our faith that we can't yet fully know. And it will help us with the hostility of the world. There are aspects of God's truth which haven't yet been revealed. And it's not part of our discipleship to be trying to probe them with our imagination. Deuteronomy reminds us again, it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. We don't know all the details of what heaven is going to be like. And we don't need to know. We know enough. We know what we've been told. We don't need to know how the resurrection body will be raised. Or what it will be like. And we don't need to know. God has told us enough of what we need to know. God has told us all we need to know about all we need to know. And verse 2 tells us here that uh, that all will be revealed when Christ is revealed, when he appears. What we do know is that he is coming. Can I say, if we know that he's coming, are you ready? 
We know that he is coming and that we're going to see him as he truly is. And in that moment, by the same grace that has made us his children, we will be made like him. And at that moment, God's image in his children will be fully restored. Mark, can you go and see what's going on in the back there? Can somebody go with him, please? Thank you, Greg. Somebody's going to be stood in the back and be very nervous. See, this kind of assurance is so very important as we live in a hostile world. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. That's verse 2. Of course, in one sense, the world does know us. It knows we are here just as it knew Christ during his earthly ministry. Grace just got a heart attack, did she? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. The Sunday school took a trip that way. We've had interesting folk come in before and uh, help themselves to things. Yeah. What the world doesn't know is that Christians are God's children. It has no idea of the love between the Lord and his people. The world dismisses it as silly, don't they? The world can't understand God's love for his people. They say it's a fallacy, it's a fairy tale, it's make-believe. We shouldn't expect the world to want to know. The world of unbelieving people can only have false ideas about the heavenly father and his dear children. We mustn't be surprised when society thinks of the biblical gospel as old-fashioned, unoriginal, and boring. It's been interesting, hasn't it, just in the last week or so, to see just how wrong the world is about the true gospel with the news that Russell Brand has been baptized. He's now calling himself a Christian. So I'm not reflecting on anything that's got to do with Russell Brand, but what is interesting is the world's view on whatever went on there. The world's view, whether what happened was real or not, is, is warped and, and messed up. They don't understand the nature of the gospel. That God changes what we were into what we will one day be. Starts making us like that. God slowly changing us. They just remember the sin. What we must remember is that this world has an end point. The world is going somewhere. History is working towards a climax when Jesus will appear. And this future fact is, is a great hope and it's a great motivation. Prince William is heir to the throne. And he lives already in light of what he will one day be. He doesn't yet possess his full inheritance, but his whole life has been and is. It's shaped by that reality that one day he will be king. One day we will be like Jesus, changed into his likeness. But today we live in the enjoyment of his grace as his adopted children, knowing that on that day we need to have nothing to fear and nothing to hide. See, knowing our future does give confidence. But it mustn't make us complacent. It makes us concerned to do all we can now in His strength, to live up to what we are and what we will be. And that leads us nicely to John's next point. Purify yourself. Verse 3. All who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as he is pure. John is picking up a theme from the, the previous chapter. A new relationship with God, brought about by God's love, will be seen in the evidence of a righteous life. Being a child of God leads to practical and personal holiness. If all our future hope is, is centered on Christ, then we should want to be as much like him as we can be. If heaven is our destination, 
we must be traveling the road that leads there. And notice how carefully John rules out any exceptions. He says this applies to every Christian. He says all. And John uses the present tense, purifies. It's a continuous process. It's happening all the time and at this moment. This present tense also helps us realize that we can never reach perfection. We can always grow more in holiness. One day we will be perfectly pure and holy when we reach eternity. But not now, not this side of heaven. And John links our holiness to our hope because he wants to give us motivation to live differently. Hope Explored is a a short three-session introduction to the Christian faith. It's a really good course to, to do if you are inquiring about the Christian faith. And in Hope Explored, they, dis- they define hope like this. Hope is a joyful expectation for the future based on true events in the past, which changes everything about my present. Hope is a joyful expectation for the future based on true events in the past, which changes everything about my present. It changes our perspective and it shapes the way we live. Think about the dedication of a world-class athlete, the sacrifice, the resources and the time to achieve fleeting fame and fortune. These goals are not only difficult to reach, they are impossible to keep. Johnny Wilkinson was the hero of England's solitary rugby World Cup uh, title. Uh, South Africa has four. In uh, 2003, right after winning, Johnny Wilkinson said this. When I was part of the World Cup winning team, I had never felt so empty as I did afterwards. All that training, all that hope, all that exercise, all that everything. I had never felt so empty as I did afterwards. But our hope, Christian's hope, is secure and unfading. Here's a great verse to remember. 1 Peter. It is an inheritance. It's an inheritance that can what? Never perish. What? Never spoil. Never fade. It is kept in heaven for you and it won't disappoint we won't get there and say I never felt so empty it's not going to happen it won't disappoint we need to see that we have a responsibility to purify ourselves this is the other side of the coin of, of God's rich love and free mercy to hold the hope of heavenly glory but then to not worry about the sin in our own lives is nonsense we can't do that You can't have one and not the other. One without the other is a lie. But how? How do I purify myself? John, tell me. What must I do? And John points us to the Lord Jesus. Not that he purified himself. Because Jesus is pure. Jesus is pure. He always did the Father's will. Even though he knew that it would often and ultimately bring him suffering. God's law was written on his heart. And to that law, he was always loyal and true. Because of that law, his life was devoted to love uh, for his father and for this world. And that's why he took the form of a servant and humbled himself to death on a cross. Only God, the Holy Spirit, can make us holy. And that is God's will. But our cooperation is important. And that is seen as we dedicate our lives to our Lord and respond to him in loving obedience. It's both and we are made holy and we must strive to be holy. And lastly, verses 4, 5 and 6, it tells us that no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Verse 4, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one 
who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Again, John reminds us that living as children of God means a clean break with sin. Uh, These verses are, are very clear. Every time we sin, we break God's law. God's law is a reflection of his perfect character and will. And any small deviation from God's instructions is an act of lawlessness. And it shows our sinfulness. Just a single small black spot ruins a white wall. Sometimes we might quite quite consciously and deliberately ignore one of the laws of our land, like speeding, theft or fraud. On other occasions we might break the law accidentally, like like when we find ourselves in a new city and find ourselves driving the wrong way down a a one-way street. I did that a number of times on one of our holidays at St. Ives. St. Ives is not a good place to be driving when it's uh, the middle of summer and all the holiday people are there. Really thankful there weren't any cameras around. But no matter consciously or unconsciously, an offense is committed. Sin is lawlessness. And the false teachers of John's time seem to have been claiming that they lived super spiritual lives and and were above any sort of uh, law or rule. And so they were free to, to know God without keeping the commands. And John wants us to see that sin is more than just breaking the law. It's an attitude towards, it's an attitude towards God. In verse 5, John sees Jesus' first coming as, as God's remedy for the problem of human sin by taking our sin away. In John 10, Jesus taught the same truth by proclaiming himself as the good shepherd who would lay down his life for the sheep. Only in death, only in its death could the lamb become a sacrifice for sin. Though it had to be spotless in order to be acceptable to God. In the same way, John reminds us of the sinless perfection of Jesus. Only someone who was sinless could atone for the sins of others. And here's the difference between Christ, God's Lamb, and all the other sacrifices brought throughout the centuries of Israel's history. The animal sacrifices had to be without blemish as they became the substitute for the sinner. But none of those animal sacrifices could ever bring proper purity. And the glory of the gospel is that the sinless one, the pure one, offered himself in the place of us sinful rebels. And his blood flowed for our sins at Calvary. And that is why the cross is the heart of the Christian message. It's God's answer to man's deepest, deepest need. God longs to bring men and women back into his family. And so God comes in the person of Jesus, the Son, to keep his own moral law and eventually die to take away our sins and make forgiveness a reality. And so the important question in the light of the cross, it then becomes, have my sins been taken away? And verse 6 tells us the answer. Do I keep on sinning? Look at your lifestyle is John's message. John doesn't ask us to think about our conversion experience. He doesn't ask about when we signed a commitment card or our baptism or or when we became a church member. (coughs) John doesn't ask us about any of those. He simply says, do you keep on sinning? He doesn't ask the diagnostic question, what must God do with you when you die? Why should God let you into his heaven? John says, do you keep on sinning? The person who does keep on sinning has not yet seen or known Christ in that personal way that is described in verse 6 as living for him. If Jesus was sinless and came to this world, especially to take away our sins, how can anyone who calls himself a Christian continue in their sin? And this is important. John isn't for one moment saying that Christians never sin. That would be contradicting what he said earlier. He's already warned us against that in chapter 1. He said, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Christians fail and Christians fall, but Christians are forgiven. But we remember that forgiveness is at the cost of the blood of God's Son. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. The sign of proper gratitude is that we don't keep on sinning. We ask the question differently. Do you hate your sin? (coughs) Do you hate messing up? Does it wreck you? Do you collapse on your knees in embarrassment and shame? Professor F.F. F. Bruce explained it like this. He said, when a boy goes to a new school, he may inadvertently do something out of keeping with the school's tradition or good name. To be told immediately, that isn't done here. A literalist might reply, but obviously it is done. This boy has just done it. But he would be deliberately missing the point of the rebuke. The point of the rebuke is that such conduct is disapproved of in this school. So anyone who practices it can normally be assumed not to belong to the school. There may be odd exceptions, but that is the general rule which has been verified by experience. Let's not muddy what the Bible makes clear. Fellowship with a sinless saviour But to keep on willingly, willfully sinning is mutually contradictory. There's no compromise as possible. And then the logical conclusion is that we can't expect to be confident on that day when we see Christ. If we are complacent about sin. And so the question is, when uh, my boys walk into a room, they will go, oh, looks like Grant. Or looks like Claudine. Oh, your kids look like you. I'm sure you've had that before. You see, when we walk into a room, will somebody go, oh, that's a child of God. I recognize, I recognize God in them. I see Jesus in them. I can see the family relation. See the relationship. That's a great compliment, isn't it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the great love you have lavished on us. Lord, would we take our holiness, our purity, our purity seriously. That while we trust in you for purifying us, would we strive every day to be holy because you are holy. And Lord, would you cause us to hate our sin, to desire to stop, to make every effort to not continue in our sin. Lord, we need your help to do that. Would you empower us to be a reflection of you, to bear the family likeness. Amen.